most loving Father, you are good and you continue to do good. And you are good in bringing us here once more, Lord God. Prepare now our hearts to receive your word with gladness, and I ask that you would use your servant to magnify you, to magnify our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will just pierce our hearts, Lord God, with the word that we would hear. And Lord, I pray that the preaching of your word, Lord, might elicit within us worship of you, elicit gratitude toward you, Lord God. The preaching of your word and the message today, Lord, will bow our hearts in humility and brokenness before you as we continue to realize how undeserving we are of you. And yet, Lord, you had reached us. Thank you, Father. Go beyond the weaknesses of your servant, Lord God, and fulfill your most holy purposes through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for your patience. I know that we have tackled many things today, but uh, please do be patient with us um, for that. We continue with our Gospel of John series. Also, we will have our memory verse recitation next Sunday. We're supposed to all recite uh, Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5 today. But uh, since gahul na sa oras, we will be doing that next Sunday. Okay? So we are still in the Gospel of John. In this section, John 18 to 19, we are looking at the execution of the Son of God. This portion of our outline, I had further divided as follows. We had seen the arrest of our Lord in John 18, 1 to 11. And then we are now in this section from John 18, 12 all the way to John 19, 16, where we are studying the trials of Christ. We had seen how Christ was brought before the priests in, in these passages. And then right in between there, like I had been mentioning to you, there was like a cut scene, kumbaga po sine po ito, where we are brought to something else that was happening simultaneously. And this was Peter's denial in these verses. And I pray that we had learned much uh, in a personal way for ourselves no? as we studied Peter's denial. And then John again, as it were, uh, pans the camera as it were, again this time bringing us to the scene where Christ was brought before Pilate. This is where we are right now. We started in John 18, 28 with this. And in this section, as we began to dissect this, we divided this further. Last Sunday, we had finished verses 28 to 40. This took us about mm, two Sundays, I think. And here we saw the first confrontation with Pilate. We had looked at verses 33 to 38. Please read that now with me. This is what we looked at last Sunday, 33 to 40. But let's read 33 to 38. And then we will read 39 to 40 before we go to what we will tackle today. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus to him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests deliver you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Let's stop there for a while. And here uh, Pilate uh, comes into a personal questioning of Jesus, which sounded more, as we had seen last Sunday, like a personal interview. And Jesus now begins to probe Pilate. More than Pilate probing Jesus, this was a time when Jesus now was seeking to minister to Pilate by trying to bring out how truly interested he was in him. Unfortunately, we see at the end of this passage that we had heard that his interest was very superficial. Deep in his heart, Pilate knew that Jesus was speaking the truth, and he knew and he had declared that he saw no guilt in Jesus, and yet, though he was confronted with the truth, at the end of it all, he rejected the truth. We had seen many gems that we could pick up for ourselves 
as we heard this narrative last Sunday. And I pray that you will remember that. If you had missed that portion of the preaching last Sunday, you can go back to our website to listen to that or to even download that. Read verses 39 to 40 with me. There we read, but you have a custom that I release now. Oh, verse 38 first, second part. And when he had said this, what is truth? He went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. Verse 39, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? Again, so here we see Pilate still not willing to make a stand in spite of the fact that he said, I find no guilt. He was the governor, and his word should have stood. But here he was still not willing to take the stand, and he compromised by offering a compromise. Would you like me to release him to you, or would you like me to release someone else to you? And the, cr- the crowd cried out, verse 40, not this man, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, we had seen how, how often, as we closed last Sunday, how often men would rather choose the wrong than the right, simply because the wrong at that particular point felt, felt better than the right. What was expedient felt better than what was proper or lawful. We had seen also that man would often rather choose man than God. And so I ended with a challenge last Sunday to you who are believers. How often are you as as a believer faced with this temptation? And how often are you faced with this choice, with this temptation, and you choose the wrong thing? I pray that you had pondered that as we had closed last Sunday. So let's continue now with the next point in in, in in the sub-outline portion of our outline, the scourging and mockery of Christ, which we find in 19 verses 1 to 7. Of course, we will not be able to finish this today, and we will complete this the next time around. Let's please read verses 1 to 7. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law, we ought to, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. As I began to study this passage, I began to see so much information in just these seven verses than we would often find just through a cursory reading. And I pray that I would be able to show that to you so that you could appreciate this portion of the story of Jesus according to to John. But let me just say this, and I bear my heart to you as I say this. Every time I I come across this part of the story of Christ, I cannot help but feel, on one hand, deep sorrow and shame. And on the other hand, profound awe and thankfulness. And I pray that that is exactly how it would hit you as well. Deep sorrow and shame, why? For what my sins have caused my Lord Jesus to go through for me. The terrible suffering and humiliation that he had to go through just because I had sinned against a father and just because the father had chosen to save me in spite of me. But then on the other hand, profound awe and thankfulness. Why? For his indescribable grace and mercy for one so undeserving as I am. 
And I'm continually reminded, brothers and sisters, that this is, this is all because of Him. And nothing because of me. And as I share this to you, I, I pray that this does not come across to you merely as a testimony. I pray that you're actually identifying as believers with what I am saying here. Now, I'd like you to do a service to someone who's beside you who might be distracted or dozing off. Can you please look? Minister to that person. If that person is using his or her phone to do Facebook instead of looking at the faith book, gently but firmly rebuke that person and say, Kapatid, salita ng Diyos ito. Now that person is dozing off. He's in now in the heavenly realms in his mind. Say, hintayin mo muna kami. Come back down. Awake, O soul, awake. Amen? Please do not miss this. Do not make light of the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have begun to look at and we are looking at more as it grows in greater intensity as we move through the narrative. Again, I'd like to remind you, his humiliation did not start in his trials. His humiliation began when Jesus chose to obey the Father to come down here on earth through the incarnation. That's when his humiliation began. His humiliation continued as he lived the life of a human being, being born into a poor family, the family of a carpenter. His humiliation continued when he entered now into public ministry and where many had still rejected him and, 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 and uh, maligned him in spite of the many people that he had healed and ministered to. His humiliation continued when he was arrested and brought to trial before the priests and before Pilate. His humiliation continued when his very own dear Peter had denied him, and when almost all the apostles had run away from him, and when one of those who was with him for three years had betrayed him. And he will, his, his humiliation will continue all the way to Calvary. And as we, as we begin to study this, I pray that we would give our hearts and minds to understanding this. I pray that we would fight to keep alert, not only physically, but also in our hearts for what God wants us to see, for what He wants to speak to our hearts as we study this. I know that most of us here have read through this so many times that maybe it does not excite you anymore, maybe it does not move your heart anymore, but I pray that it would change. I pray that that would change. I pray that every time we come across a story of the passion of Christ, our hearts would never fail to be moved. And so, let us read verse 1 again. Today we will look at only up to verse 3. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. Now what is scourging? Scourging, I'll be mentioning this to you in more detail, was another word for scourging is flogging. Another word for flogging is whipping. Now we need to understand, brethren, that scourging or floggings often preceded or came before crucifixions. This was something normal. Beatings were a regular punishment themselves. Sometimes a prisoner would be beaten by the soldiers. Bugbugbugin po. Beaten with sticks, for example, or rods. But flogging or scourging, which was much more severe, was part of the death sentence. So as if the execution was not enough, the guilty person would first be subjected to scourging or flogging. But before we look at that in greater detail, I think the question now begs to be asked. After Pilate had said, I find no guilt in him, we need to ask the question, why was Jesus flogged after being found not guilty? 
Now we need to understand, brethren, that this was not a case of following legal protocol. Pilate himself was not following the proper legal procedure. But you see, in those times, and, and unfortunately even today, often Roman rulers made judgment calls according to their own mood. Eh, type kong pahirapan siya eh. And that was where the offer to release Barabbas failed. Pilate did not see good cause for Jesus to be sentenced to death. As we had seen the past few Sundays, he knew, he knew where these Jewish religious leaders were coming from. He knew about their envy. He knew about their ambitions. And he knew how they had wanted to use him for their own purposes. And Pilate was not ready to be their pawn. Especially after he had seen Jesus and was convinced that he was guilty of no sin or crime. And yet because we, as we had seen also the last Sunday... Pilate was also a man who was not willing to stand for the truth. He was a man who was not interested in absolutes, and that was a problem. We saw that last Sunday. If you are not interested in absolute truth, then you will be a person who would be happy with what is called relativism. You will be someone who right now would say this is wrong, but tomorrow since it doesn't feel like it's wrong, it feels right, then tomorrow it's right. And what is wrong for you may not be wrong for me. And that's fine. And what is right for me may not be wrong for you. Or may, may not be right for you. And so, kanya-kanya tayo. That was the kind of person Pilate was. But he was convinced that he, Jesus did not deserve the death penalty. And he tried, as we had seen, a first compromise by saying, hey, you have a custom to release someone. Would you like me to release Jesus? But the crowd chose Barabbas. That first strategy failed. And so here, Pilate may have hoped that this vicious punishment of scourging would satisfy the Jews. This vicious punishment would cause them to give up their demands for Jesus to be crucified. Now, I want you to please mark your Bibles in John 18, and I want you to turn to Luke 23. There you will see the parallel passage, this time from the eyes of Luke, who gives us a bit more detail. Open your Bibles to Luke 23, 14 to 16, and, and verse 22. And here you will see very clearly what Pilate was hoping for by having Jesus flogged. Verse 14, start in that portion of the verse that says, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And as if to corroborate his findings, he now cites Herod in verse 15. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Watch verse 16. I will therefore punish and release him. So he was trying to have Jesus released. Look, verse, look at verse 22. A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. That, is what, that was what Pilate wanted to do, release Jesus. But again, he wanted to compromise. He wanted to please the Jews to a certain degree because of their hatred for Jesus. And so he subjected Jesus to the flogging, to the scourging, hoping that after Jesus went through this horrible punishment and the Jewish people would see what had been done to him, they would say, okay, okay na yan. Release him now. That's what he was hoping. But as we had looked at verses 1 to 3, 
There you will see that bottom line, Pilate gave in to these accusers and permitted the flogging. And not just the flogging, but the mockery as well. Take a quick look at verses 1 to 3. And that is what we will be looking at today. Although he may have thought that the scourging or the flogging would shame Jesus' accusers to the point that they would say, okay, that's enough, you can release him. Although in his mind he used the flogging or the scourging to hopefully end up with that result, bottom line is this, the scourging was totally unjustified. Because the scourging was supposed to be a promise or a punishment for the one who was found guilty. And that's why the point of the flogging here, since again he affirmed Jesus' innocence in verse 4. Look at verse 4. He again affirmed it. Now it seems very clear that to Pilate, the scourging was an alternative to crucifixion. So again, he had Jesus flogged as a strategy to set Jesus free. Because by the time you read verse 4, and by the time you hit verse 6, Pilate would have three times clearly declared, I find no guilt in him. He really wanted to set Jesus free. He may have hoped that the blood, the scourging, would produce, would satisfy Jesus' accusers. So evidently, he was trying to make an appeal to the sympathy of the mob, hoping that they would be satisfied with the punishment of the scourging and therefore would call for Jesus' release. But then again, here, hello, we know this, right? This was another attempt on Pilate's part at compromise. Compromise number two. The Barabbas compromise didn't work. So let's try the scourging com compromise. Again, it did not work. We all know that this whole idea of Pilate's was a futile idea. It's crazy. It would not work. Now I want you to pay attention now a bit and maybe use your imaginations a little as I describe to you how horrible scourging was. Those of you children who sometimes have tasted the spanking of your parents, how many of you adults, when you were children, uh, tasted of the special turon of your dad? The sin turon. I have tasted that many times from my dad, and let me tell you, it was never pleasant. And of course, the younger I was, the louder I cried, because that was painful. But the scourging, that is nothing like that. Scourging was a horrible, cruel act in which the, the, the victim would be stripped, and then he would be tied to a post and beaten by several torturers. And these torturers were mostly soldiers, battle-hardened soldiers who would alternate when one would get tired. Now answer me this, how long will it take a battle-hardened soldier to get tired? Now, for victims who were not Roman citizens, the preferred instrument was a short wooden handle. So imagine now a short wooden handle to which several leather tongs were attached. Now, each leather tong had pieces of bone or metal attached on the end. And the beatings were so savage that sometimes the victims died. The body could be torn or lacerated to such an extent that muscle, veins, and even bone 
would be exposed. And such flogging often came before the execution to weaken, to further weaken and dehumanize the victim. You see, no one died of immediate death on crucifixion. At least not the crucifixion that Jesus went through. That would take hours. And so what they would sometimes do is to hasten the death process on the cross. They would weaken the prisoner or the guilty one with such flogging. Now the number of lashes was determined by the severity of the crime. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 3, for example, there you will see provision for flogging. And the maximum that was to be given was 40 lashes. Now, later on, the Jewish leaders brought this down to 39. Let's see if that would help. <laughs> but why 39? Just to make sure hindi sila sumobra dun sa 40. Remember, they were so meticulous about details of the law. But as I've said many times, such flogging often killed a person so that the victim did not even survive for the crucifixion. Now, I'd like you to read with me what the IVP background commentary adds as information to this. Just read this. Don't copy this. In the provinces, soldiers normally administered this punishment. Free Romans, these were Roman citizens, were beaten with rods while soldiers with sticks, but slaves and probably despised non-Romans with whips, whose leather tongs enclosed sharp pieces of metal or bone. Now, Jewish law allowed only 39 lashes. Roman law allowed scourging till the soldier grew tired. And texts report that bones or even entrails were sometimes bared. Sometimes it would be flogged, from the back, sometimes it would be flogged in front. I guess those are the times when entrails would show. This was horrible. The evil that men do, brethren. How they invent things to produce such suffering. How evil men are or have been who would use scourging and flogging. Now, before we continue, we might also quickly condemn Pilate for allowing this upon Jesus. And yet, shameful to say, brethren, there are still so many Pilates in the world today who flog Christ. Today, who flog Christ. Now, how do they do that? How do they flog Christ? I think there are two ways in which they flog Christ. One way is through the persecution of the followers of Christ. When believers are persecuted by others, those who are persecutors are guilty of persecuting Christ. Remember Paul? I think that was in Acts, was it Acts 9? When he was on his way to Damascus and Jesus appeared to him and, and Jesus called out to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, of course, Jesus was no longer there. there. He was speaking to Saul from his heavenly throne. But Saul was on his way to Damascus to persecute followers of Christ. And yet when Jesus spoke to him, that is exactly what he said. Why are you persecuting me? One way the flogging of Christ continues today is through the persecution of the followers of Christ in many places today in the world. But you see, there's another thing that happens here, that is, which is part of this first way that Christ has continued to be flogged. There are also those who, for the purpose of saving the life of someone who is being persecuted for the faith, push the one being persecuted to deny Christ, to deny the gospel. Now, that person might not be a persecutor. That person might be a relative of the one being persecuted. That person might be a fellow Christian. 
who tries to convince the person who is suffering for Jesus to deny the gospel, to deny Jesus. And I believe, brethren, that is still a, 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 another way of persecution of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if and when that would succeed, the denial of Christ, the denial of the gospel, then it exposes Jesus again to ridicule and dishonor. It makes the persecutor think, see, I have won over you. See, your Jesus is not worth suffering for. See, you gave up. Forget about this Jesus. Th that's another way Jesus is flogged through the persecution of his followers. Now let's bring this home a bit to ourselves because I believe that there is an application here for us as believers. When you malign, when you slander other believers to their detriment and harm, when you refuse to take the biblical steps in confronting someone, maybe with his or her sin, and therefore you resort instead to slander and maligning, I believe you're also guilty of this. Kasi sinisiraan mo, anak din ng Panginoon eh. The one who you're ma maligning and slandering is also a temple of the Holy Spirit in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And so when we are guilty of this, aren't we also guilty of flogging our own Savior and Lord? And I want you to think about this right now. And I want you to think about this in such a way as to ask yourself, when was the last time I was guilty of slandering and maligning another for whom Jesus died? Simply because I'm not willing to forgive. Or simply because I'm not willing to confront as Scripture prescribes. So ang gagawin ko, eh, kakausap na lang ako ng iba. Maghanap na lang ako ng kakampi. At siraan siya. So I believe that that is one application that we can see here. Another way that Christ is still being flogged today is this. People today still flog Christ, how? Through the shameless flogging of His teaching. There are people today who select only parts of the gospel, for example. The parts that are nice, the parts that talk about the love of God, but not the wrath of God, not the holiness of God, not God judging punishment. The parts that talk about bringing people to heaven, but not the part that talks about condemning people to hell. And so they strip the gospel, cut it into pieces, as it were, throwing away the offensive and convicting parts and keeping only that which, was, which is pleasant to hear. The flogging of the gospel or the teaching. They, they do this when they corrupt Scripture to suit their purposes, to promote their beliefs instead of God's beliefs or God's teachings. So, pipiliin na lamang. Hindi lang po ang gospel, pero buong Biblia. Hindi ituturo ang nakaka-convict. Pipiliin ang pleasant. We will choose only the pleasant. And this is, and as if that were not enough, what they would choose, they would even corrupt, they would even distort to suit their own purposes, to promote what they want others to believe and not what God wants them to believe. And that's why we have to take extra care, brethren, when we handle the Word of God. And bringing this home to ourselves, you yourself, when you choose to ignore the commands and reproofs of Scripture. And instead heed the dictates of your flesh. I believe are also guilty of this. When you 
know this is what the Bible says, but you decide to ignore it, set it aside, and not read it, not study it, not meditate on it, just so that you could continue to pursue your own preference or the dictates of your flesh. In that way, you flog the teaching of Christ. I want us to think about this as well. Is there a part of the gospel that you are ashamed of? So that when you share the gospel, you make it the point not to mention that part of the gospel? Is there a part of the, of the Bible that you are not willing to study or to meditate upon simply because you know it will convict you of sin and because you prefer not to be convicted? You would rather choose to set that aside and forget that it was there? Maybe something for us to think about, right? Let's read now verse 2. They really went beyond their orders to whip Jesus. They, they were not ordered by Pilate to put the crown of thorns on him or to put a purple road, robe on him. They went beyond their orders. They also engaged in ridiculing Jesus' claim of being a king. And they do this by placing a crown on his head, a crown of thorns, and a purple robe on his shoulders over and beyond what they were ordered to do. And, and what does this tell us basically about men, ungodly men, men who do not fear God, would seize any opportunity to do evil whenever they can. That's the nature of sinful man. If it were not for the restraining power of God, Man would continue just to seek to do all the evil he can do. But that's the nature of man, of ungodly men, men who don't fear God. Any opportunity to do any evil, they would seize. They would seize. Now, if this reminds you of our nation, of our people, of our government, and brethren, this should drive you to pray for our nation. This should drive you to ask God for mercy and forgiveness upon our nation. Again, I'd like to read to you what the, what the IVP background commentary tells us about this. Just please listen. Soldiers played games like throwing knuckle bones, coins, or dice. The chance to play games with a prisoner would come as a welcome respite from their customary boredom in a foreign land. Can you imagine? Ang ginawa nilang laruan, ang bihag, ang prisoner. Pahirapan, pahiyain yung, yung prisoner. The Jewish ruler Agrippa I was ridiculed in this manner in Alexandria. And so what happened here? After the whipping, these soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on Jesus' head. Now, traditionally, brethren, this crown, and again, I'd like to appeal to your imagination so that this would become a little more picturesque for you. Traditionally, this crown made from long spikes of a date palm, and some of the spikes would sometimes extend as long as 12 inches. And they would radiate outwardly like this to mimic the radiant corona that emperors would use. The corona that you would find sometimes inscribed in the coins of that period. So traditionally, it was thought that this crown was an additional instrument of, of torture, but it seems more probable, brethren, that the purpose of the thorns was not necessarily to inflict physical suffering, but simply to, as I've said, to simply to imitate the radiating crown which Oriental kings wore at that time, as you would see in the coins of that period, as I had mentioned earlier. But even if that was so, even if that was so, for sure, no doubt, some of those spikes, 
still had cut deeply into Jesus' head, adding to his pain and bleeding. And believe me, that crown was not put gently and say, oh, kagagalaw, oh, careful, kasi matalas, okay, oops, sorry, sorry, masakit na. No. I'm sure that crown was just dunked upon his head. And then, brethren, as though that were not, not enough, these soldiers further amused themselves by another crude joke. Knowing that Jesus was called King of the Jews, they now throw upon him a purple robe. Purple signifying the color of royalty as a continuation of their mockery of him. Now, where did they get this robe? This, this robe may have been an old, faded, purple robe that belonged to a Roman officer whenever he would face the courts. Or it may have belonged maybe to a magistrate or a judge. Or it may have even been an old rug. Didn't matter. At the same time, this robe may have been the very same robe that Herod used to mock Jesus with. In, in, in Luke 23, verse 11, remember? Pilate, when he found out that Herod was around, he sent Jesus to Herod. And if you look, look at Luke 23, verse 11, Herod also, finding no guilt in him, mocked him and gave him a gorgeous robe. And then sent him off to Pilate. That's what Luke 23, 11 says. So when Jesus, by the time he came back to Pilate, he may have had that robe with him. And so this may have been the same robe that these soldiers used to continue to mock Jesus. Whatever this robe was, it was really not meant to, to honor the Lord. Which brings us now to verse 3. Read now verse 3 with me. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! And to give him slaps in the face. That is such a horrible description. Slapping. Slapping the Son of God. Slapping God. What an indignity. Honestly, I'd rather be punched than slapped. Ibawon dating ng sampale. I want you to put a marker in John 19, 3. And let's go to Matthew's account because in, in Matthew 27, Matthew gives us more details, more horrible details on the mockery and humiliation that Jesus was subjected to. Read verses 27 to 30 with me. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Notice, he was not humiliated just before a few soldiers. They called the whole Roman cohort to come and witness the humiliation. And then in verse 8, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Hinubaram pa sa harap ng lahat ng mga ito. And then put this scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. Now, the reed is not something soft. If, if you're familiar with these thin uh, portions of the bamboo, we have several of this at home as decor. These are hard, but they are basically reeds, but hard. And so they put that in his hand as a mock scepter. Para kompleto yung, kompleto yung, yung look mo. Di ba? May crown ka, may cape ka, now kailangan mo ng scepter. And so they put a reed in his hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now watch verse 30. They spat on him. And they took the reed and began to beat him on the head. They did, not, they did not beat him in the body, they beat him on the head. 
See, whenever I talk about corporal punishment or the spanking or the using of the rod with our children, by the way, I wish that many more of you parents were there last Friday when we talked about verbal discipline, which we will continue this November. Please, if you have children who are still dependent, may they be one year old or 19 years old who are still living with you. Please come. Please come. I've always warned parents against hitting their children on the head. Babatukan. Gagamitan ng ruler. Ano ka ba? Brethren, that's not just painful. That is humiliating. Have you ever had teachers in school who would knock you on the head? Because you couldn't just, you couldn't get the explanation of the lecture. Hello, are you there? It's humiliating. And so they take this reed and hit Jesus on the head with it. I want you to picture the whole humiliating picture here. This was the Son of God, the creator of all the universe. And they were treating him this way. Now go back to John 19 with me. With that, they also declared, Hail, King of the Jews. Now we need to understand that hail is derived from the customary salutation of the Roman emperor. Hail, or, or what they would use really is Ave. Ave Caesar. Hail. Now, of course, we know, brethren, that Hail, King of the Jews was a mocking tribute. In the form used on approaching emperors. And so here, they were making a caricature of Jesus. They were making a spoof out of Him. They were making fun of Him. But you see, we need to understand something about this. There is an irony here. Again, what is an irony? It is an outcome that is the opposite of what you would usually expect. And and, and brethren, the irony here is, is this. These soldiers spoke the truth more than they possibly knew. Because Jesus Christ is indeed the King of the Jews. He is indeed the King of Israel. Remember Nathaniel's declaration? In John 1, 49, when Jesus told him what he saw of him, Nathanael said, you are certainly the king of Israel. What an irony. The soldiers who would never acknowledge that in their mockery was at, were actually saying more truth than they possibly realized. And as I'm shown, though this corning was not enough, as though this corning was not enough, they went on to give him slaps in the face. Brethren, all these, the scourging, the mocking crown of thorns and purple robe, the ridiculing in hailing him king of the Jews, the physical blows, all this or all these were part of Jesus' profound humiliation as he identified with the sin of the world. John had mentioned that when he quoted John the Baptist presenting Jesus, he who takes away the sin of the world in John 1, 29. All of these were all part of Jesus' profound humiliation as he identified with the sin of the world as God's servant, according to Isaiah 53, and as our Savior. He went through this. 
Alam mo mga kapatid, di bali po sana kung right after he was sentenced, he was brought to the cross and nailed. But as though that were not enough, they subjected him to this horrible torture and this unbelievable humiliation, brethren. And I'd like us to understand that this is all in keeping with the prophecy concerning Christ. Turn your Bibles with me to, to the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 50, verse 6. Open your Bibles to Isaiah 50, verse 6. I'm wrapping this up now. Have you found it there? I'm going to have to press this button now. All of this, this profound humiliation is in keeping with the prophecy of Christ or concerning Christ in Isaiah 50, verse 6. Read that with me. I gave my back to those who strike me, my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. Apparently, Jesus was not just slapped. Some soldiers tried to pull his beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Look at how precise that prophecy was. Because that is exactly what Jesus went through. Now I'd like to stop here. And I'd like to ask you now this question. How has the recounting of this part of Christ's suffering and humiliation affected you so far today? Has it affected you? If it hasn't, my dear brother, my dear sister, I believe there is a sickness somewhere in your spiritual life. How has the recounting of this part of the suffering and humiliation of Christ affected you so far? Brethren, it is my prayer that you're continually being humbled by all this. As you are reminded that our Lord Jesus went through this, culminating soon enough in the cross, He went through all this for your sake to save you from hell. And that's why it is my prayer that you're continually being humbled by all this. I pray that you're saying now to yourself, Lord, you went through that for me. You went through that horrible torture, that terrible humiliation. You are the Most High God, the Creator and Sustainer of all things, and yet you were treated like trash by the one that you created in your image and likeness, by those for whom you died. If that doesn't humble you, dear friend, I don't know what will. But at the same time, brethren, I pray that all of this also would elicit in you profound gratitude for His grace and mercy upon you. That though you and I are so undeserving, Jesus went through all this for you and for me. I want this to sink in, brethren. And I would like to stop here. I don't want us to just close our Bibles or our notebooks and go out of this sanctuary, as if we just heard another story. That ah, I know that anyway. No, I pray that the Lord right now is touching you. And whatever sins you and I might have right now that we had not confessed, that we had not repented of, are the very same sins that brought Him to this place. And those sins that are unrepented of continue to flog him. And when our testimonies are ruined, those sins continue to humiliate him. 
I want this to sink into our hearts right now, brethren. I know this is not a happy message, but really when you think about this, this is not a happy message, but this is a joyful message in the sense that, hey, guess what? You are the one supposed to be scourged and humiliated. And later on, you are the one supposed to be crucified. But Jesus took it all for you. It is a heart-rending message on one end, but on the other end, it is a joyful message. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord. And I, I don't know, Lord, how this message, Lord God, had affected your children who are here. But for those of us, Lord, who are already believers here, I pray that this would renew within us fresh humility, fresh gratitude towards you, thanking you again for, for their salvation. But I also pray for those who are here, Lord God, who are not yet saved. If right now you are here and you know that you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you still do not understand the gospel, and I even pray for you who are here who think you're a Christian, but you're not, not in the eyes of God. I want you to understand that there's a reason for why you are here today. This, you're not here by accident. To hear this message so that you would be informed of what Jesus went through for you. And this was just the beginning. He took up your sins. He carried your sorrows. He was pierced for your transgressions. So that by his wounds, you would be healed of the greatest disease of all, sin. But friend, just hearing that and knowing about that won't save you. You need to come before the Lord right now and ask Him for forgiveness for your sins and call out to Him and say, Jesus, save me. I receive all that you had paid for through your suffering and humiliation for my sins because I cannot save myself. Lord, who are we anyway? that you chose to come down here in the first place and to go through all of this horrible suffering and terrible humiliation, Lord, just so that you could save us, just so that you could adopt us to be your children. And Father, you sent your only begotten Son to take our place. Oh, forgive us, Lord, for all our sins. Forgive us for our sins as believers. Forgive us, Lord, when we take for granted the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive us for each day that passes that we forget to thank you for our salvation. Thank you for this precious reminder, even now. Can we all please stand and before I close, can we just sing this song that we had sung earlier? And as we sing this song, which was called from Isaiah 53. Let's sing it with all our hearts. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows yet we considered it stricken by God smitten by Him and afflicted but he was pierced but he was pierced for our transgression he was crushed he was crushed for our iniquity the punishment that brought us peace the punishment that brought us peace the punishment that brought us peace
our infirmities. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered it stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was fierce for our for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace, the punishment that brought us peace, the punishment that brought us peace was upon thee. Declare it now and by his wounds, by his For suffering on our behalf, Lord. We are healed, and by His wounds we are healed, and by His wounds we are healed. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the great price that you had paid on our behalf. Thank you for your love and mercy and grace that we don't deserve but so desperately need. Thank you. Burn this message in our hearts, Lord. Let it affect us for the rest of this week at least. Let it change our praying. Let it, let it change our thinking. Let it change our speaking and our acting. Let it change our worship. Let it change our lives again. Thank you, Lord. As we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord God, may we always give cheerfully, our giving being a form of worship. May we give, Lord, with the right hearts, hearts that overflow with love for you and for your work here in Guiding Light. And may we give out of faith, Lord. Though we have many needs, Lord, we give out of faith, knowing that you are our great Jehovah Jireh, from whose hand, Lord, we eat. Thank you. Guide us now, Lord, in all our giving. And as we go forth from this place, Lord God, I pray your blessing to be upon each one who had come today. Let them go forth always rejoicing in you and seeking always to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. God bless you. Please greet one another with the love of the Lord. Worship team, we have a short meeting. Sister Emmeline.